Thanks for listening to Fluff and Crunch, where we talk about the connection and sometimes disconnect between system, setting, and story in tabletop RPGs. Does that does that say employee of the month or what? What does it say on it? Yeah, it says employee of the month. Okay. What's the and picture? This is uh, it's a soldier. Oh, oh, okay. Cute. How are you today? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm all right. I'm all right. Doing all right. I I thought our our conversation. And I don't. I want to figure out when we want to drop this one because it dovetails off of the most recent episode that dropped yesterday on the 26th, our, our conversation with Jim Johnson. But um, what anyway, game have you done, Jeremy? Have I done any gaming? Yeah, I played yeah. more of our 5e game. Uh, that is moving. The pace is um, is picking up like, you know, and I mean, that makes sense. Like as you, you get past the like the, the climax of a plot or to the point where you know what, what the baddies are, where they are and that kind of thing. Uh, we're we're in that zone, and so things are starting to happen uh, quickly. And we just hit seventh level, which that makes people in five E land happy and stuff like that. Because you got a level, uh, although not much. Ex- I don't know. Odd levels is always good if you're a caster because odd levels means a new spell class, a new oh. spell level. So oh. seventh would be what level four spells. So. That's why two of the four players were happy. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. If you're a caster. I- Every time you hit an odd level, it makes a difference. But if you're not a caster, it's like the I'm a oh, fighter, and i I picked up a I picked up an okay, but I don't think particularly useful in this campaign um, archetype ability. But whatever, it's 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 like I said, we're steaming right along. It's been it's been good. It has been actually very good. Me looking back on now being a player for like almost six months straight, which it, I don't I don't remember the last time. It's probably been fifteen years or more since I've done that. Um, it's uh, it it's been good. So how about you? Uh, no, we did meet, but then Brian hadn't had time because of work commitments to do anything on his game. Um, so we just played more wrestling again. So and I think it might be well the same this week. It's just like i've I've done my bit so i don't really want to like plan something else because i finished my D D bit and i don't really want to go ahead to like whatever the next game is um well we're kind of like yeah. brian's meant to be finishing off his D D game but then he just hasn't got the time with work stuff to to finish off so right. i don't know what's gonna it's gonna happen but i'm glad i finished my bit like my bits my whole storyline is is done so i'm happy with that cool um, very good well, let's get on to the topic of the day, which is our review of the Star Trek Adventures Captain's Log solo RPG. As I say, going dovetailing off our conversation with Jim Johnson about it, which I thought was really fascinating. I know you still got Han there, and I've still got yeah, because we're still doing the same topic. So I didn't yep, change. Same topic, same backgrounds. Um, so neither of us front end, neither of us have played this yet. We have not played the solo game, and so. We're going to avoid comments on like, this is how it plays, because we would just be talking out the sides of our heads if we tried to do that. So we're going to focus on what's in the book, what we've read and what we think of it at this point. And then if we get around to playing it, maybe we'll do a a play report or something like that in the future. Um, So how do we want to go about this? I've got the table of contents in front of me. Um, I think we just do what we normally do. We kind of skim through the book and and pick in stuff up. So... I mean, we can forget chap- chapter one's like what's in the book, so we can forget that. Yeah, the book is a little over three hundred and twenty pages long. I know. I was a, I was surprised when we got the PDF. Like that's that's a long book for a solo. Yeah, three thirty six okay. is the PDF with the covers. Um, but I think part of the thing is because they do another. They do like a streamlined version of the rules, and that's. Yeah. But I haven't said that the rules don't take up that much space, so it's not that that's taking up the space. But I guess because there are rules for character creation and like the rules are in it it's longer than you know if, if it just been a, a solo add-on it wouldn't be this long yeah. um but yeah and, and remember he jim said that this is in part the hoped for target audience is people who have not played and don't play 
Star Trek adventures. And so they would need, you can't just say, yeah. we'll do this with the rules if people don't know it. Uh, one thing I want to throw out though, uh, you, you say, yeah, the rules aren't really that, um, they're not that, that different from Star Trek adventures. But like I said, the book, the PDF is 336 pages, and that's what the front and the back matter. Um, over half of that, just over half of that, I would categorize as background. Yeah. Like getting to know Star Trek and getting to know what Star Trek is all about and getting to know the different eras of it. And uh, that's over half the book. That is 178 pages of the 336 pages is that. The rules section, the rules of play is about, uh, what, about 40 some odd pages. And then there's a section that's another like, 25 some pages that's called playing captain's log that takes you through examples of the steps of the process so really if you wanted to slap those two portions together you're looking at about 70 pages worth of rules and examples and flow charts and stuff about how to go about doing the game and then the balance of the book the last like 70 some odd pages is um is tables matrixes they call them to make it sound more spacey uh but uh but it's it's just uh, it's random tables so that's how the book breaks down yeah so so chapter one forget chapter one chapter we could go into this in more detail but essentially they give you a bunch of background on star trek so you know we have a sec we have a section on society and then we have one on technology which is you know, there's a lot of stuff in here. So like you said, it's, you know, you can read this if you if you know very little about Star Trek or if you know enough, but don't really understand how something works. Yeah. Kind of that kind of stuff. What kind of different weapons we've got. I think, you know what, I, here, here's what I'll say. I think that if you are a, like, let's say you're someone who's a, a relatively new Star Trek fan, or you'd consider yourself to be only a very like low level fan that like, you know, you've seen some of the movies, you've watched maybe some of the newer series, but you don't have like, like if you're not steeped in, you haven't watched a bunch of Next Generation, you haven't watched a bunch of the original series movies. If you're like a Discovery and dreadful J.J. Abrams movies, you know, if if you're the last like 15 years of Star Trek, this will fill in so yeah. many potholes. It'll connect so many disparate pieces and you'll see this coherent whole that is Star Trek. I think they do a very nice job of of presenting it that way. Yeah. So I'll carry on. We've got this thing on service protocols, and in that is really weird because they have a two-page spread on Starfleet's naval tradition and lexicons. That seems very odd to have in a solo game because if you're playing by yourself, who's like no one else is gonna care. I don't you know what though? I think for a sense of feeling like it's you know, you, you give yourself the the um not what's the word? Verisimilitude. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That sense of realism. Yeah. I think like if you're going to write because this this and as a you know teacher of sorts I love the fact that this game encourages you to write you know not to write things down but to actually write um I think having this sense of like what amidships what does that mean center line what does that mean like these naval terms I think that's cool because if you incorporate that into your writing then you look at it later it's going to look and read like a captain's log which makes it yep. feel more real we get a whole page on that thing that Jane Way only uses when she feels like the prime directive. Oh yeah, that thing. Um, and here, if you own the player's guide or the GM's guide, or you own both, and you see that like 20% of each of those books is verbatim, it's the same thing because it's the same background. I will offer a judgment here and I'll say that the background and the way that the Star Trek as an idea and a property and a, a phony future history is presented. I think in Captain's Log, this presentation is the best of those three by a long shot. Um, like I think if you're a Trek fan and you went through and read read this, you would oh yeah that, or you would make connections that you maybe hadn't before. And these were things that they they did in Player's Guide and, and GM's Guide, but I think they just I just think it's presented more effectively here. And we get a nice section on errors of play where yeah kind of goes and like literally breaking it down so we have the, the the bit we don't talk about enterprise 
Uh, and then we get, so essentially what they call, they call it Federation and Empire, but essentially they're talking about original Star Trek. Yeah. Um, and then we have, the next again, they, they, they're names for the things, allies and adversar adversaries, which is strange. But essentially that's next gen into Deep Space Nine. Mm -hmm. Then we have post-war, which of course a lot of people go, well, you know, post-war, what? But that includes, well, the end of that is Picard, but that's where Lower Decks is set as well. Yeah. Of course, if you're not to watch Lower Decks, you have no idea what's going on in that. I movie. really like, I really like in this section of eras, like I, I think looking at, you know, sometimes it's, if you want to get into how things feel, you have to get into the details. Like original series feels, original series era feels different than Next Generation or Deep Space Nine. But sometimes for looking for like, like an overall vibe or like I said, looking at Star Trek as a single entity, when you pan back and you look at these different eras alongside one another, for me, that's a, that, that, that kind of gets the juices flowing, gets me thinking like in a Star Trek mode. So I like, again, how this is, how this is presented. Like, I think the balance and the explanation of what each era is and what makes each era what it is, um, would be useful to a player or a GM. And that's something yeah, we haven't and, said here. Yeah. And it's, it's good to point out the kind of like, the you know, the whole point of the original Star Trek was the whole five-year missions thing, the exploration thing. And that's how Next Gen started. But by the end, that kind of guy, and particularly like Deep Space Nine, obviously, I mean, not just the fact that it was based on a starship, therefore they, uh, starship, space, there, that space station. Therefore they couldn't do exploring, which is not true. They went through the wormhole. But obviously that just by the end of it, it was all about the the Dominion War. It, you know, it had gone into that whole thing. So like Lower Decks then hits on the idea. Well, actually what happens next is that they do go back to like, you know, the the, the exploration, the five-year mission. Um, see, now when I played with Scott and Brian, I played actually beyond that. I played in the essentially the time period of Star Trek Online where because it's an MMO, they wanted to create a load of conflict. So they have kind of like loads of stuff kick off and, and that's the setup for that. But that's, I think I played maybe just to the start. Of they do give us a bit on the temporal Cold War, but again, that's Enterprise again. So let's pretend that's not in there. Um, and then we get the 32nd century, which actually, if you're really interested in like, well, I want to do, I mean, this is why I really hope we get a second discovery book. But if you really want to do, well, I want to go, you know, boldly explore and, and we don't know what's going on. Well, that's, quite you know that's a good time period for that because like you know there are klingons and actually we don't know if there are queens mm, maybe we do or don't but like you know it's all of the aliens we know and love but like the federation isn't really a thing anymore and and so there's you know there's a lot of changes to the politics but the kind of a lot of the other stuff is there the technology is all crazy wacko in the future as well though. um but that makes it you know after discovery's first two series where it's like what the hell are you doing you're just making up random stuff they then got to do oh we're actually going to do star trek now all oh, right cool it took you three seasons to get to it but well done for getting to do star trek eventually <laughs> um so that's quite cool and then you know they give us two pages on that so that's actually yeah. that's the only information we have on that because we don't have anything on that anywhere yeah. else now uh, and, go on i was gonna say after that it, it talks about the different styles of play and 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 i think it's important if you are if you're considering this book and it's called captain's log which obviously very powerfully implies that you're going to play the captain that doesn't that doesn't have to be the case and so this uh this chapter where it talks about this part of the book where it talks about styles of play it talks about admiralty campaigns or maybe you're playing an admiral uh you know controlling like a, a fleet or parts or a task force um cinematic campaigns campaigns that are individual episode or see you know it, it it addresses a lot of the things actually that are um that are mentioned in the uh the gm's guide for gm advice about different types of Star Trek. You don't just play Star Trek. There are different types of approaches, like mindset to like, how long is the burn for the plot? How long it's going to take for things to develop? Um, how big is this going to be in terms of scope? Are you talking about like one quadrant or one sector or whatever? Um, this goes and explains those things over again, but it, I don't actually find this redundant. This is a return to the same set of topics that the GM's guide addresses. But again, I think that the, the team is just learning and yeah. I find this a more effective and more thought provoking um, uh, presentation than I did from the, from the GM's guide. So if you have that already, I think you'll have a, a, a better read from this one. Even if I like, you like how that then they kind of, 
they go into then sort of the difference between if you were going to be more like the movie based things where big stuff happens and higher stake to as opposed to sort of like you know the tv things where yeah they're season long arc so things are dragged over longer things um, and then different ty- different types of mission like science yeah. focus and tactical focus and you know political intrigue and i mean they're teasing out all the kinds of things with examples from the movies and the the series all the, i mean and when you and this is where, like I said, panning back and looking at Star Trek big picture, I think is useful because you recognize like, wow, you know, there's like every different kind of plot type you can find in, in Star Trek. And it sits yep. in this, this, this certain kind of backdrop. And there's an interplay between that Star Trek backdrop and the political intrigue story that makes it a Star Trek political intrigue story. And so there's information about these are all the different types of things you could do in captain's log, whether you're a captain or an admiral or a commander or whatever. Um, but yes, there's, there's a lot of, again, this is, we'll come back to this a bunch more times, but there's a whole bunch of different suggestions there, which even, you know, which do, even if you were going to just use this because you know, this is your first look at Star Trek role playing. This is, there's some really good stuff in here for how to yeah. just what to run. Um, then we I get... think the, the, the first time we'll, I'll mention this, at least, is that if you are a Star Trek GM, Star Trek Adventures GM, and you're actually not interested in playing a solo game or running a co-op game, which is more GM-less or gm light, not traditional GM role, there is a lot in this first half of the book, a lot that's really valuable for a GM. So at that point, we've done 70 pages and it's all just sort of background and the world and ideas and how it could look like. And then we get into character creation rules, which, yep. I mean, I don't see the need to go over this in huge amounts of detail. It is, it does have a life path thing, yep. Um, but it is more simple than your character creation, uh, well, your characters for normal Star Trek, mainly because you don't have, what are we missing? Are we missing, we're missing talents, aren't we? Talents. So we still have we still have our six attributes we still have our six disciplines we still have focuses um but then and they actually one good thing about that we get nice big tables of suggested focuses mm-hmm. for um for the the six disciplines which is cool um but there and we get values which values were guess a little bit more important arguably um yeah they, they, because they variants. because they values take up some of the space narratively that talents would mechanically so they they are a little little more but yeah those the random tables and the then the the detailed explanations of how the different attributes play out like like control when faced with violence when faced with a physical problem when faced with an intellectual or emotional problem like how does control look differently in different situations they talk about that for each of the the attributes so again all of like this here we are on page 75 and we're just getting into mechanics but everything to this point, and then including this, I think is is useful for an existing Star Trek Adventures GM um, or even player. Yeah, I'm just I'm looking at the next generation species table on page 94, and because it's a D20, we have the equal chance of being a human and a yeah. soon type android. It's like, aren't there like five of them and that's it? Yeah, I'm that's a, I, I think that, yeah. But yeah, yeah some of the, the, the random, random table, table, what are you going to do? Yeah, what are you going to do? uh anyway so they give us lots they get there's there's a lot of uh there are a lot in that table of different um of different species and then they give us a nice little thing of how to make your own very quickly Mm -hmm. um or if you want to do other ones so like i gave that example uh to to jim last time of how in how in discovery season four the president is a human slash bajoran slash cardassian hybrid which is like Okay. Get carried away. Why don't you just stick in a fourth species while you're at it? Um, anyway, but you know, the, the, so there's a rule there. You could look at the other ones and compare them and go, well, that's what I want to have. Um, again, like we said, we got a, a nice life path thing. So by doing, if you follow the life path, you would the, do the thing that we like about life paths, where just in creating your character, your character will have sort of a little bit of a backstory and an idea of how they were brought up and maybe what drives them. This will generate your values. Um, and, you know, that means when you start playing, you've probably got an idea of what your character is, you know, what they are like, why they, how they're going to act, that kind of thing. That, that's why I like Life Pass. I think Life Pass is the best way of making a character. You know, people talk about doing it in session zeros, but then 
I also find that very difficult when you've got like multiple people mm. because either you're going to have to, the GM has to do it with each player separately or, um, you know, like they, you, all the players all knew each other at the start, all the characters knew each other right from birth, which doesn't really make sense. So everyone does their own life path thing. They know how their characters are going to work. Now, in this case, you're okay, you're solo, you're only having one person do it. But I just, I like the way that having done a life path thing, you have a, you have might have a grasp on what your character is like, how they're going yeah. to play, why they do the things they do, you know, unless they died in character creation. Yeah, I'm going to jump in because I think I, happens in this. Yeah, I no, it doesn't. I, I thought about this as to when I should make this comment, and I figured I should make it now so I don't forget to make it in 20 minutes or 25 minutes. Here is a place where if you have zero interest or plans to use this for its stated purpose. If you're a Star Trek Adventures GM or player, especially GM, and you are considering this book, this is where the utility kicks in right away, like really concrete utility, because you've got all these random tables for focuses, for values, for species based on era. So if you need NPCs, boom, you can just get some d you need two d20 some of the uh the random tables are from two to 40 because they you know they take two dice uh most of them are are you know it's it's a single die 20 roll but you could generate so many things and even if you're i mean if you're sitting there like oh good lord i have i have to run a game in two days and i have no idea what i'm going to do i'm just going to start rolling and, and generating some like random crap in the form of some npcs and maybe an idea will come to me this is it right here Super powerful. And the, the list of races, I mean, they left out the pictures and they left out the talents. We talked about that with Jim last week. And that enables them to include a metric crap ton of species. Um, yeah, I mean, it'd be nice if the pictures of the characters were in the book, but at the same time, it's not difficult to just go on the internet and type. No, not at all. And then there you go, you have a picture. I'm happy trade off for that because there's no way that they, I mean, the page count would be obscene with yeah. all the species that they have. So yeah. I'm fine with that. If you don't know what a Kazon or an Illyrian looks like, or a Horda, Horda looks like a shag carpet with some styrofoam glued to it, because that's probably what it was, uh, just go look it up. So yeah, lots of species. And again, here's a terrific way. Just I would just look through these and think like, uh, Kazinti, like if you've never watched the silly cartoons from the 70s and you don't know what the heck the Kazinti are, you never played Starfleet Battles, just reading through here and looking at ideas, I, I think as a GM, this could be a um, a wellspring of of ideas. Um, we do again get alt, uh, not so creation in play. So yeah, exactly like you would do. Well, the same idea as Star Trek Adventures. Um, the character development rules are slightly different. You said mm -hmm. this because really what they're doing here is like when you hit a milestone, essentially the idea is you're meant to change things so you can like put one attribute down, one up, and discipline one down, one up, and swap focuses. So your characters aren't getting better, better. they're just different. Um, yeah. And it explains why in the book, and Jim kind of explained it last time, is actually from one episode to the next, but characters do seem to like be able to do different things. If you were desperate, like if you wanted to start, like, like hypothetically, particularly if you were say, I want to start with like a lower deck style thing, but I'm going to play this for 10 years. Yeah. Hypothetically. And I want my characters to actually get better over time. Then there's, you could just go and look at the Star Trek adventures rules for, you know, advancement. It wouldn't be. Actually, you know, that would be a, that'd be an interesting way. If you're going to play this solo, that'd be kind of a cool way to like plan it that way. Like, okay, I'm going to play like the first log or two that I, the first game or two I'm going to play, I'm going to be in the Academy. And then I'm going to be yeah. on my cadet cruise. And then I'm going to, you know, you just map it out how you want. So you could even say like each of your adventures could be, there could be years between them, between promotions and assignments. Like each, yeah. each adventure you, you play for yourself could be a different assignment. Yeah. Almost like cool. Conan style, how like, yeah, you know, you don't, we don't have to do the story in between. It's it not have to be like, serialized. Yeah, like it could truly yeah. be episodic. Yeah, which is a cool idea. Yeah. And um, incidentally, the, let me just throw this in here with the life path. There's stuff in here for Klingons as well with like houses and junk like that. So you, you, you're you not just the, – the default is Starfleet, but you can play non-traditionally Federation peoples within Starfleet. We do get a nice little thing on how if you want to take your Star Trek Adventures character into the simpler yeah. uh, Captain's Log character, how you do that. And going the other way, which is super, it's like two pages, so it's super straightforward. Yeah. Um, I think, you know what? I think it could be cool, you know, with, because when you make your traditional Star Trek Adventures characters, you have, you have you know, you two career events. 
you know, ship blows up from under you, uh, you know, solve the diplomatic dispute. That'd be kind of a cool thing just for yourself if you wanted to flesh out your character and have some random elements thrown at you for you to have to think through. You know, you've got your character that's a commander in Star Trek Adventures, and they survived a, a you know, a, a ship being destroyed. You could say, well, that happened when they were a lieutenant junior grade. So you could just yourself play through this and recreate your character as a Lieutenant JG and have that ship explode or be destroyed or whatever. And that for just yourself, like getting to know and fleshing out your character, I think that'd be a great way to not necessarily retcon your character, but just fill in something for yourself. Uh, we then get, again, just like STA rules for creating, I say rules, great your ship where you basically take a basic ship and then you add on a few bits and pieces and that is kind of simplified a little bit but they give us a whole bunch of different ships and mm -hmm. like and from every single star trek period so again going all the way back to enterprise and then going all the way ahead to the 32nd century we get um a whole bunch of things of course that does mean that we have a janeway class but i'm gonna just uh, yeah just pen that out of my book that never happened There's just no scribble janeway it out class. Although the one above that potentially is worse. There's a friendship class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't, is that from the series? Uh, is that like, is I mean, that from? I yeah, I don't know because I don't really, with the exception of sort of like, yeah, I don't, I haven't really paid attention to the different class, the ships yeah. when they're in the 30 seconds because they're still on the discovery. So there are other ships, but I hadn't noticed they've been given like official names. Yeah. So I don't know whether this is, they made this up or this has been announced in the program. I don't know. Um, but, but yeah, there's yeah. A, in the 32nd century, you have, uh, you got a couple of different things, but yeah, you're right. There's a huge list of ships. Uh, if you have Utopia of Planitia, a lot of them, there's going to be a ton of overlap, Yeah. but not 100%. So there's, if you already have that and you're thinking about this, you will get some utility in the form of some extra ships. Um, and strange, we do get ship talents. So that we didn't get people talents because they were like, there's no real need. But obviously the ship talents are things yeah. here like ablative armor and the cloaking device, which without those, then your ships that like don't have the cool stuff they can do. So we do have ship talents. We just don't have, yeah, we just don't have people talents. And again, there's there are some random tables. There's the ship talent matrix, which you roll three dice. So it goes, the results go from three to 60. And you have a ton of what could be random. Like, let's say, I don't know, I just thought of this. You know, you're, you decide that um, you're running Star Trek Adventures and the, uh, your, your player ship is going to encounter some kind of like, uh, like ship graveyard, like alien ship graveyard around some kind of a ancient, whatever. Whatever. And so you just need to come up with a handful of ships with different pieces and parts. Just roll here. And you're you're good to go. So then we do hit chapter five where we do get into the rules of play, but there is overlap here between so there yeah. might be rules we have to talk about. There is overlap here between the solo play rules and the actual rules because the idea is is that you kind of you you basically roll you have you kind of create an episode and a mission, what the mission type is. And then you actually roll encounters throughout that. Mm -hmm. And then so the rules for both how the solo bits work are kind of merged in here through it. So we'll kind of try and piece it out as we go through. Yeah, it, it's interesting. The uh, the It's actually on page uh, 184. You know, it says create your character. It has a, a seven step process. Create your character and ship. Okay, select your mission type. So there are matrices for general types of missions that you can either select from or you can roll from. And then you go through this process of generating an incident theme, advantages and complications. Like basically you're starting from big picture and you're progressively narrowing it down by adding details to, okay, this is a, a deep space exploration mission. Um, what's the incident? There's a neutron star that's giving off weird radiation. Uh, what's the theme of it? What are the, what are some things that could be helpful or challenging right from the jump? So what you're doing is you're you're using these random tables or just picking from them uh, to sketch out the basic, like the foundation of this episode that you're going to play, taking you to the fourth step, which is roll your encounter. That's like, how does things actually start? What's the inciting incident? The first, you know, the before the credits roll in your first episode. So we have to then go into some of the solo stuff. Yeah. So the idea they have here is that you have you have a, a main objective, 
and you're going to have a bunch of scenes which go and the way they say suggest this place say each mission has three acts and now they suggest that each act has five scenes now that is why on the thing called the mission tracker we have 15 slots on the mission tracker yep. now it does say straight away there's a mission length thing so well if you don't want to do 15 separate scenes because that's fair enough that does sound like a lot but i mean if you actually think of a star trek episode they probably have way more than 15 scenes because some of these scenes could let's be a very short conversation mm. between like an engineer and this to just like you know toggle a dial or whatever probably not toggle a dial because that's not star wars it's that's like we do a star trek here. um but you know that that's so it depends how long this, you know the scenes are long and because you're doing this ideally it's designed at this point at solo that scene will not be very long you know this could be a few minutes so 15 scenes wouldn't be ridiculous no if you were going to take this and do this for like you're going to use this as the gm for other things well then you wouldn't use the mission tracker anyway and if you were doing this yeah. like cooperative then maybe we go right. Well, our scenes are going to take longer because there's going to be more talking. Yeah. So yeah, we'll knock it down to three or four scenes per act, and so you'd you'd bring the mission tracker down. So I do think give... that the the that as default structure, three acts, five scenes per act. There's a there's a good amount of explanation that's it's Star Trek like specific in that it's obviously for the purpose of you using this book, but it's there's a good amount of writing in this book about like storytelling and how stories are structured and how plot is structured um and how you know the three act plot is pretty standard um in a lot of literature and, yeah. and movies it's what we're most used to uh, whether you recognize it or not and i think and I'll, I'll i'll call this out i i think they do a nice job for someone who's like trying to think if you're a gm and you're trying to think about how can i think about thinking about, thinking about, I mean it that way. How can I think about thinking about putting stories together? The stories are more effectively constructed. There's good advice in here about that. And, and this structure that's provided on your reference sheet is, um, is built off that advice. So, and this is where we then go into kind of, like I said, they, they mix in the rules for the task resolution to the rules for the solo stuff. So essentially there's a point that says like, you know, I, a scene might have multiple tasks or it might just have one task. So that's kind of, you have to decide that you do it. And then it mentions here the probability matrices where you just go and look at the end of the book for like what the scene's going to consist of and certain things like how difficult a scene is, which so again, this is going to be a mix of you deciding like, well, I think this is going to be really easy or I think it's going to be very difficult or using the probability matrices to decide for you. Um, the most important thing we get, here, we, we get our basic rules here for task resolution. And this is the first thing which is different from normal I guess, normal Star Trek adventures, because having set your difficulty and choosing to roll, if you succeed, so standard things, you get as many successes as, as the difficulty, then you gain momentum. Brilliant. But if you fail, you gain, uh, oh no, it's, if you roll fails, anytime you roll a 20, you also gain threat. That's basically the same as. Yeah. Um, and as remember that threat. if you didn't listen to the you. last episode, momentum and threat are not, you don't count them. They are statuses. So you have momentum or you have threat. You don't have a certain number of them. It is a status that is or isn't. It's binary. Pretty much. Um, and then having decided, well, essentially you have to decide like what the main thing is for the scene. So that this is the important, and this is where it comes back to our mission tracker thing. Uh, if you feel that you succeeded at a scene, so you know you succeeded the vast majority of the task, whatever, then you literally tick in. Well, it, it here says fill in the delta symbol completely. Be easy enough to just put a tick over it. Um, if you feel and this is because the mission tracker has the little Star Trek delta things for each of, of course the course they do. If you feel that you failed at a scene, you place an X in that delta symbol. Um, once each delta in the first act is marked, you proceed to the second act. Yep. Uh, and that's how you essentially carry on until when you get to the places. Once you completed all three acts, your mission clues. How do you do? Um, and then essentially you kind of decide it if you've had lots of successes and only a few fails or, you know, you, then you've presumably succeeded, or maybe you've succeeded the first two acts, but the whole of the last act is a fail then, you know, it's, so really the mission tracker isn't like, there isn't some clever thing here where the mission tracker is doing, like, if you build up loads of successes, it makes something easier. Or if you keep building up loads of threat, it get a big part, you know, that's not happening. There's a very straightforward you know, it's a yes or it's a very binary kind of yes, no thing for every scene. At the end of it, you can judge your overall thing. Now, this is somewhere where, you know, if you've played a lot of other solo role playing games, you might say, oh, like, well, I've played other systems that are more complicated. Um, yeah. And and so have I. 
and there'd be nothing stopping you using some clever thing. Oh, actually, I want momentum and threat yeah. to work like how they normally do, but I'm going to make sure there's a mechanic that says, when I build up 10 threat, then it automatically affects my... You could do that. You house roll it, like same as you do anything else. And because this is solo, you've got no one else telling you what you can or can't do. So just, uh, you know, do it. Yeah, I think the, the there's... You know, sometimes you read rules in a game and there are there are things that are left silent and you as the reader are left wondering what the heck is this supposed to mean because the the rules are they're vague okay there are some things that are left silent in rules where the author says i'm not going to address that or you figure that out and sometimes you feel like you feel like wait i paid for the game why aren't you giving me the rules you you feel like they ripped you off they're not doing that here uh they they, they it's very clear like these are this is highly narrative the mission tracker is meant to accumulate, call it like narrative evidence, yeah. not bean counting for points for a score. Yeah. So there's, there are plenty of times in this book where essentially it says, you make the call. And I'm fine with that. Like the way that this is presented, because it is so narrative heavy, um, that's, that, that feels right. It doesn't feel like they are trying to like chintz you on the rules. It just feels like, I mean, realistically, you're, you're sitting there by yourself yeah. rolling and the game is taking place in your head and then you're writing down some things and it's just meant to be a creative exercise, your creative exercise, you're in charge. So, you know, do you think you, the act went well for you based on how you creatively thought through the creation of the story? You figure it out. Uh, they They don't. They don't they don't pathfinderify this and, and make it all mathy and stuff. They don't yeah. do that. I appreciate that. And then we get kind of call outs here to stuff that's at the back of the book. So mm. more on the probability matrix, the advantages and complications, you know, more things about what your encounters are going to look like and a whole bunch of other things, kind of how you can tweak this. We get some more explanation here on on essentially this idea of a momentum and threat, which like you said, you, you, there is a point of momentum. You either have momentum or you don't. And there is threat or there isn't. Now, the one weird thing I still find about threat is like once threat is generated, is this thing, you choose whether threat is spent immediately or stored for later. There's no, yeah. there's no thing that says you have to ever spend that threat. I mean, I kind of feel like if you ever generate a second point of threat because you can't store up threat, then the second oh, threat so just triggers wait, straight away, something like it, that. It, no, it, it, I think this, this solves it. On page 192, it says, it is your decision whether you want to spend or save threat. You must either immediately gain some form of a complication, there's the immediate use of it, or increase difficulty during the next, next task roll. So there's your store for the future. Either you suffer the problem now or on your next roll, whenever it comes up, that threat gets expended by making it so. And, and the, the, the difference here is when you, when you use threat to increase the difficulty, it means you have to roll two successes, not mm -hmm. one. Um, but, you know, they, they've, they've made it really straightforward and it's simple yeah. and they could have made it really complicated. Yeah, they could have. Like a lot of solo player games, there's a lot of bean counting and, and checking thing and tables. And like I've, I've seen ones where, you know, you're having to kind of cross-reference how many successes you got so far with whether you think something's easy. And it gets weird. You know, you have to sit there with an awful lot of paper in front of yeah. you trying to work out. It's the kind of thing that what you really need someone to do is have written a computer frame for you, at which point, why aren't you just playing a computer right. game? Well, um, I have so a couple of I have a forward. couple of old school um, bookcase solo war games, like with the little square cardboard chits, and they have all these. This game called Ambush has all these like sliding matrixes and stuff yeah. to to generate, you know, to create like a paper AI for the game. I love the fact that they did not attempt to do it. Essentially, they're saying you're the AI. You, yeah. You're not artificial even. You're supposed to be figuring this out. Here's the framework. And they give you all these random tables and ideas and, and this, this sequence to throw a bunch of creative variables at you. But it's your job to figure out the story that connects all those things together. There isn't some scientific process by which it works out magically for you. You're right. If you want that, go play a video game. Um, we get a bit of rules on like how values work and how values can affect the game. And then we go into the actual kind of more. So what you get is a nice kind of thing in different actions. We have these things for investigate, diplomacy, overcome adversity, theorize. You know, these are, this is almost kind of 
like if you think of a powered by the apocalypse thing how everything you can do is a move yeah it's kind of like that you know it's set up in a way of right well here's the different things your characters might want to do and here's what success and failure looks like and here's what it'll look like if you have momentum and here's what a complication will look like there which is nice again it's this this is where i try and say all right well this isn't the same as your standards you know you're not gonna have a combat order you're not playing things like yeah. that this is this is how you can set up different scenes and the different kind of things that have been going on um and you mentioned combat uh you know the the you don't have some kind of a the game doesn't roll against you when you're in combat either starship combat or personnel level combat you're the only one rolling obviously you're the only one playing a game when you roll if you're successful you apply a hit to the opposition if you are not successful you fail you apply a hit to yourself problem solved so you're not even rolling for like there aren't um you're not creating other characters that are sitting there and you're using their stats to roll against yeah. you it's like when you fail you suffer a consequence you not a comp consequence like a complication but then you 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 suffer a uh, a hit and um and you can be you know taken out of the scene if you take enough hits so i i think it's a clean way to not over because you're right they could have complicated this thing like from here to gibraltar and it, it would have just been a mess and they chose not to and i yeah. appreciate so that the, like the conflict rules are really straightforward yep. and even where they go into like tr they add bits on which you can do but it's still not super complicated and then they've got stuff for starship which again is starships done but it's nice to kind of flow charts um where they, they even give us like a, you know a harder version and an easier version yeah but again we have a, basically a flow chart for how starship combat works and it's like i said it's pretty similar to yours that if you succeed the enemy's hit and if you fail your hit this this is the kind of thing you might go right if you are actually going to you're playing star trek adventures as standard you may well want to go but i don't like the starship combat so i'm going to use the simplified version yeah, out, of, out of captain's log everything in here is a it's not it's i don't know simplified or streamlined i don't know which one you go whatever you could dicker over the word but it's nothing in here is rules wise so fundamentally different or no. from the original rules it's just a different version of the rules and i think that if you wanted to make this more complicated layering in what's already in star trek adventures adding it here and there where you want it would be easy likewise yeah, I mean, if you want to use some of this stuff in star trek adventures like the starship combat rules i don't i don't see it as a, a hard trade out it's it, i think it's a smooth translation or would be it, it, it reminds me of the difference of how like different ways you can run scenes in cortex where like some versions kind of like leverage where you'd run an entire fight scene purely and clearly on you roll a dice that's the score you get and the other person can roll a score and if they beat it then you just win the scene done and it, you yeah. know three roles and the entire scene's done and you then narrate a whole massive combat where elliot beats up a room full of people or when they came to marvel heroic every single punch and kick and action was a separate role and the bad guy role for their defense the next player went and it took ages Th this is kind of that it's not necessarily more you know super streamlined it's the same role you're still yeah. rolling the same things and you still have the same you know all of the rules are underpinning it but it's much much quicker because the task the resolution of a scene is now a handful of roles maybe you know five well you three in is it three four five roles could determine the entire scene instead of you know 20 or 30 it's the kind of thing you know when we complain about 5e because the combat drags out because people are missing you've got to get the bad guys hit points from 200 down to zero and it takes ages this is just avoiding that yeah. because that's you know it's not as fun right sometimes people like rolling dice when there's a lot of people because it's fun oh yeah, i rolled a critical yeah. Woo, exciting when you're by yourself, that kind of thing goes out the window. So this is getting the resolution done a lot quicker. Yeah. So the next section, it goes into the different uh, modes of play. I don't, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it gives an explanation for why play something solo. And I think, that obviously, if you can't find anyone else to play with and you want to play Star Trek and you don't want to just sit around and stare at the wall and imagine, you want to have some structure, this is perfect. I personally would – I see this more as a, a – a GM planning tool and like creative, you know, get the engine going kind of thing for me if I'm going to run Star Trek Adventures. It also they also talk about co um, collaborative. Yeah. Well, th this is the stuff that when I saw this, where I suddenly this is when it was in this section, I went from being kind of oh, this book's all right, but I don't really see the point of it to oh now now I really like it. 
because I, you know, if I wanted to play solo Star Trek, I'd, I'd play a, a computer game. Yeah. Straight up. It would look. Yeah, that, that would make you happy. Um, but this then goes into like the rules for collaborative storytelling and then rules for guided play. You know, so collaborative stories, that's, oh, that's great. I've essentially done that with Brian in D&D, where we're like, well, there's only two of us. I don't want to do one-on-one D&D. That sounds lame. Well, let's play two of us. We'll make up the story together. We'll have our characters. We'll get to do all the cool stuff we like in D&D, but we'll make up the story as we go. Well, this is what this suggests. And then it goes sort of a step beyond that, where it's like you said, it's a GM tool, but this kind of goes in a GM tool, more of like almost like make it up as you go along. Where the GMs, at least he says, the games master does not need to spend time preparing for the game night. You're just going to sit down. The players have all got the characters, and the GM is going to go right. I've planned nothing at all. We're playing Star Trek, and then you just roll the entire thing. Now, obviously, a good GM can take the ideas that don't work from the tables and turn it into something a bit more. We bring in a character from a previous game, or take a thing at the end of one game and go right. Well, I really like the thing that happened in this game, which was all random for my next session. We're going to take that storyline and we're going to we're going to run with that. But it, it, this this is where this book goes from being it's only for solo players to it's not just for solo players. It's for it's for anyone that wants to play Star Trek. It could just be for solo players. It could be people that want to play Star Trek and have a group that no one wants to GM. Um, it could be for a GM like me that's just lazy and hasn't got the time to prep. Or it could be like you've said repeatedly. Um, for a GM who actually has got the time to prep, but this is gives so many ideas because we've still got another hundred pages of this book left. Um, someone who's just looking for some inspiration and some extra ideas or where the players go off book because players go off book all of the time. Uh, and it's, you know, particularly in Star Trek, it's very easy to go off book. Yeah. We're not going to do the mission. You said we're going rogue. We're going to go and fight the Romulans. Right. Thanks players. Okay. I, I don't know how to do that. Well, yeah. get this book. I think um, that the uh, looking at those the three modes the solo the co-op and the guided um, guided seems to me to be like diet traditional role playing game I, and I and I, I see that actually as the least of the to me at least the least useful the least interesting of those three modes you don't think so are you agreeing I think it's better no? who you are for for me I would I would love that to be able to go right guys I have planned nothing yeah yeah I am going to completely the, wing this. And this yeah. book would let me do that. I think yeah, you might, I think not many the, people are going to do that. No, I think that the co-op mode, though, I think that's really interesting because if you got a couple of Star Trek fans together, you could. There you go. You play different captains. You play captains of different ships in the same fleet, or you could play. I, there's all kinds of options that you could do with that that you could then work together to build a cool story. So I, I see value in that. On. Um, the constructing your universe and how to play. This is the whole series. This is another, what, like 30, 40, 30 pages or so, 20 some odd, 30 pages of, it takes the all the ideas in the first half of the book and the rules, the process for Captain's Log, and then provides that storytelling and story structure and story pacing advice that i had mentioned earlier that's where you you find it in this book so these are yeah. ideas about not how to work the rules but how to use them to do what captain's log sets out to do and this is again this is stuff that isn't even just you if you were just playing star trek adventures standard this yeah. that stuff in there is good advice for that um and then this is where we get all of the crazy tables almost yeah one last thing i wanted to say about this uh this chapter playing captain's log I think it's important to have a chapter like this for a game like this because solo RPGs, they're, they're atypical. They are not that common. Uh, they're a newer thing. I know that Tunnels and Trolls was solo 40 something years ago and still can be now. But by and large, role playing games are not solo events. And so I think having more information about how to go about doing it using the i think that's i think it was smart that they did that yeah um and uh yeah and valuable but now we get to the the big chunk at the back i mean our, our, our first thing is a really straightforward probability matrix which is just for kind of the players decide do you think how likely do you think something is or isn't and then you roll on a 
a d20 yeah. on the table for whether it's yes or no very straight you, you know, like see that. lots of other things but then everything else from there this is where it's useful for again this is where it doesn't matter whether you're playing a solo or co-op or lazy gm that's not what they call it but that's why i'm calling it um it or is. you're using it as just gm tools you know we have tables for literally i mean the crazy thing is that there is a mission type table which has 18 different sub things and each of those sub things has 20 different things i mean that's basically what, is it, what 400 different missions i mean so if you were playing star trek once a week that's you have about 70 pages years. Okay, oh, that's a lot of there is about 70 pages of random tables with prefatory remarks that explain and give you yeah. some ideas. You know, there's just there's so many different things. If you had no idea if you were the uber lazy GM and you wanted to spend five minutes planning, you could come up with an evening session or like if you're sitting and thinking, all right, I, I want to run a, a, a season. For Star Trek Adventures, you could just roll through this yeah. for ideas. And it's more than just, oh, it's a diplomatic or it's a defense mission or it's espionage or first contact. It, like you said, it goes into deeper detail. Like there are 20 planetary, planetary exploration ideas. There are 20 political ideas, 20 research and development. It just goes on and on and on in a good well, way. Because then we get like advantages and complications and mm. we get a whole bunch of different like where the encounters are, you know, assuming they're yep. not just in space, like tons of them. Um, but then we even get things for like momentum spends, which is great because you can, again, use that if you were just using this in the normal game, just useful stuff, like things that happen, what, what you know, what good and bad things might happen. Because then we have threat spends as well. So this is the kind of thing, like one of the things we like about 2D20 is the idea that you can spend threat on cool stuff. But when you're playing a pre, you know, a pre-bought, you know, from Modiphius, that'll have threat spends in it. When you're making up your own, maybe it, sometimes it's hard to think, oh, what could I do for a threat spend in this scene other than just, you know, ninjas arrive? What do I, I don't yeah. know what to do with it? Um, but here they give us, you know, it's more, more threat, more random threat spends, which you can, you know, it doesn't have to be random. The whole point of a random table is you can roll it on random or you can just pick the thing yeah. that looks cool and use that. Well, um, and that's the bit that, that that section there with all of those tables that's the bit where this book again becomes really useful yeah well i mean um, looking at the, the looking at the table of advantages and advantages is just supposed to be things that could like they kind of temper what's going on maybe there's a helpful primitive species there's a redundant systems involved lucky circumstances uh, historical historic precedent advanced prototype and there's there's an explanation for each there's like one sentence explanation and then on the complications table it's like disease outbreak infiltrator mesmerized crew like and these aren't necessarily this isn't the plot itself this is a wrinkle or something that you could throw into it or use to to like color the plot uh again yeah you could either roll or just look through it and come up with ideas you know, you so so what if you roll like, OK, the type of encounter, it's an abandoned place. So you rolled 16 orphanage with dark past. <laughs> OK. I don't know what that adds up to, but. And then actually it's funny because then the next section is about allies and adversaries, but actually it's more random tables because <laughs> the whole idea is you're just rolling your skill and a success is one thing and a failure is another thing. So we don't need stats for the bad guys. So instead, what we get is like archetypes for the bad guys and where the bad guys are from and the bad guys' goals and bad guys' tactics. And, you know, we get we get rules to like randomly create monsters, like how big they are and how they what they look like and their behavior. So it's just loads more tables of stuff and yeah. space tables. And it just we just keep going. Um, and we get a whole bunch of sections then for for planets again, which is which is great because that would be useful again for just normal star trek things be able to create a bunch but included is there a whole table somewhere in making the names for the planets did i imagine yep. that? i can't where that is and um, and like how many planets are in a in a system and sector and you know there's there's a whole set of pages you, you talk about the the uh, random threat spends those are categorized gravity hostile alien entity psionic incident ship in distress i don't I, I don't see sitting at the table as a GM and rolling on these because I can't think of anything for threat. What I see myself doing is when I decide, oh, okay, there's going to be a ship in distress. That's going to be one of the things going on in this, this episode. 
and I look at this list and I go, collision, computers malfunctioning, engines malfunction. I'm going to put those in the back of my head for when complications are rolled or I want to spend threat. I can go ahead and I have some some other ideas on top of like what seems right in the moment. Yeah, I mean, just so much good stuff. Even good, like we have ship damage, including how many crew are killed. And then at the end, we get a whole bunch of just random additional matrices for yep. like just other stuff that might be happening. And that's where we get this weird name generator thing. And so there's just there's so much good stuff in here. Yep. Um, so again, whether you know it's it's called Captain's Log and it's intended as being a thing that helps you play solo. But for me, the reason I love this book is that this book could help me play Star Trek in lots of other ways. I, I, I'm I never going to use this book to play solo, but I might use it to play with Jeremy online right. because we do a podcast and like, you know, this this is quicker than playing normal Star Trek. True. Uh, and, you know, so we could easily just do a cooperative or they call it collaborative storytelling. We could just we could spend a couple of sessions doing some cooperative Star Trek games. Yeah. Um, you know, we could I could use this with my group because. I often don't have the time to do whole sessions to either, you know, I could plan it ahead. I'm, I, yeah, like I said, I, it's unlikely I would just sit down with nothing and go, I'm just going to wing it and roll some stuff because it could turn out to be terrible. But certainly it would only take 10 minutes then to roll a few things on the table to give me a starting point. And then, right, we're going to go with that. Yep. Um, and if you're running out of inspiration as you're playing, there's just so many tables that do so much cool stuff yep. on it. So, yeah, I, it's I definitely worthwhile getting it. Yep. And actually, right near the back, they have the Captain's Log Quick Reference, which shows you all the different where things are, where they're found. That's that's easy. And then it has yeah. the yes or no probability matrix, which if you haven't seen it, it's, it's a table that has um, seven degrees from highly probable to highly improbable. And then you roll die 20 based on your decision like, hey, I think this is 50-50, yes, no is Yes is 1 to 10, no is 11 to 20. Whereas if you get to highly probable, yes is 1 to 18, no is 19 to 20. It just moves in degrees. Um, so that's really important throughout the game. Um, I think the only bad thing about it, if you were using a solo, there's a lot of tables you'd have to go through. That's a lot of page flicking. What would be yeah. really handy if someone did like a digital version of it where you could like click on the table you want and it pops it up and you click on that table and it rolls it for you and tells you what score you got. Yeah. You know, I mean, so someone essentially could type all of, you could just do that in a spreadsheet. So we could type all of this stuff into a spreadsheet and mm -hmm. have it all go, but that's quite that a lot of work horrible. for someone to do. It does, I, but, you know, some, someone might do it and then it'd be like, thank you person that did that. I think that having the physical copy of the book would be a lot easier. Yeah. The, you know, the, 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 the PDF, uh, the the page numbers and stuff, they're they're bookmarked. Um, but I find popping around between pages on a PDF harder when you're trying to look up something and like you know stick a finger here and stick yeah. a you know you, you could really easily make use of those slim um, post-it notes, the little like ones yeah. that look like little rectangles, and put those throughout um, as you work through it. So, final thoughts. I mean, I, I really liked it. I remember like, you know, when they announced it thinking just why. Um, I still a part of me that thinks I just don't get where this idea came from. Um, and then for the first half of the book, I was like, you know, this is well written. There's some interesting stuff in here, but I still don't really, you know, I, I, I don't really get why they've done a solo thing. And then when I realized that there was all of this stuff in there that you could use it for more than just solo, that there's all these different ways of using this and you can use it you know, with these rules, or you could use it with the Star Trek Adventures rules. Um, there's so much good stuff in here. Like I genuinely, like I mean, like the Starship book, I really liked because there was some really cool Starship stuff in there. But I think this is maybe even better than that because I think any any GM or anyone that's thinking of playing Star Trek a bit and doesn't have a GM, which is therefore that's kind of everyone, um, could find use of this book. I just yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm really amazed at how good this this book is. So yeah, to I me, look at it the next purchase after the red core book. yeah like after or instead you, of the core book yeah after you and i talking through this and you know me i've been reading it and i look again i haven't played it yet it I, I don't i actually don't look at this as a purely solo rpg that happens to be star trek this is a terrific reference book about star trek about star trek storytelling about storytelling a terrific toolkit for primarily Star Trek Adventures GMs, and to a certain, a lesser extent, players, but very you know, huge for GMs that happens to present 
different play modes, solo, co-op, guided, that fits with those things. So I think that's maybe a better way. If you're a Star Trek Adventures GM, don't look, well, this is a solo RPG. I'm not going to do it. You will get so much utility out of this book. So much, so much mileage. I think that's the funny thing is that even on the, you know, the front of it says caps lock solo role-playing game advertise it as a solo thing. And that's how they advertised it. Then the back print does say, oh, you can play it co-op to your friends or, you know, or the GM could do it, but it, it, you know, it could have gone bigger on the, on the other stuff it lets you do, which is luckily, that's what we're doing. We're, we're going to yeah. shout from the rooftop. This is brilliant. Everyone buy it. Um, yeah, I, I'm amazed at how good this book is. And yeah. I kind of hope that they do similar things then for, let's say, acting Cthulhu or because I, because a huge chunk of the work in here is the table. You can't yeah. port this into something else. No. You could do all the work yourself. Um, but yeah, yeah I'd the love structure, to see like a, the other ones. I really hope that these rules, like the structure of the rules are added to the SRD. Definitely hope. But yeah, I mean, yeah, you could be inspired by the SRD to land at these, but it'd be easier if they just put them there. But you're right. You can't just copy and paste the tables because the tables are full of Star Trek, Star Trek specific stuff yeah. for the most part. Um, but I would love you could to do it see in you could You could do home world. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, funnily, funnily enough. Yes, you could. Uh, yeah, I could. I could totally see this for um, like Conan. I know yeah. Conan, but you mean like the the lone the lone uh, savage warrior? I could totally see that for this because then you don't you just move from place to place and kick ass. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm really impressed with this book. Yeah, I like I just I maybe it's one of those things because my expectations were so low. The, and it's like it's, right. it's easy to exceed my incredibly low expectations but uh, <laughs> uh, i know i think it's, it's just a really good book uh, yeah yeah it i i believe it is i was curious like i didn't actually have i didn't have a uh an opinion going into it on the front end i but i was it exceeded as i read i i kept seeing more and more and more value and the way that it's written and the way that it's organized is it's very intuitive it 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 as a book flows very well from front to back. Yeah. Um, so cool. Look at that. Unequivocal. Two thumbs up, two snaps up in a circle. Yeah, it's good. But go and buy it. Yeah, there you go. Go and buy it. We don't get a cut. Damn it. Should have <laughs> asked for a cut. Thank you so much for listening. You can visit our show's homepage at anchor.fm slash fluff n crunch that's f-l-u-f-f n c-r-u-n-c-h we would really appreciate feedback and reviews on whatever podcasting platform you're listening to this on thanks so much